All right, very good. We are going live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 106 live stream of the Data on Kubernetes community. As always, a pleasure to be here with everyone. Before we get started, really basic, just housekeeping stuff. If you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel right now uh, already, please take advantage right now. Smash that subscribe button. Tell your friends, tell your relatives, get in your Christmas cards, do whatever you got to do. Um, really excited to have two wonderful guests with us today. Um, join us from Yellowbrook Data, and they have a very interesting journey um, that they've been going through, moving from on-prem infrastructure, getting all that stuff onto Kubernetes. You know, out of 106 live streams, we've seen lots of different folks at different points in this data on Kubernetes journey, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what their experience has been like. I'm joined today by Matt, who's a principal engineer at Yellow at Yellowbrook Data, and also Mark, uh, who's a CTO. Um, welcome to both of you, and we can start out with, uh, I guess we'll start out with you, Matt. Can you just give us a little bit of background about yourself, uh, what, you, what you've been working on in the past, and when you started working with Kubernetes? Sure. Um, so I've been at uh, Yellowbrick Data for about six years. I joined the company in its very early stages. Um, I came from a primarily a systems background, so um, you know, device drivers, storage, kernel level stuff. Um, so I've worked in a variety of areas in the product, you know, from our execution engine to our user space kernel, device drivers, all the way up to some planner stuff. Uh, but a lot of my stuff has been focused around um, clustering, which is one of the reasons why, you know, when, when this opportunity came to work on Kubernetes, it was sort of a logical fit for me. Uh, as far as how long I've been using Kubernetes, I'm actually pretty new to this whole technology. I've only really been using it in earnest for a couple months, really. Um, I started kind of the beginning of the year, uh, a lot of learning and sort of ingesting from the fire hose, as it were. Uh, and then realistically, all of this work that we're going to show kind of has come together in the last couple of months. Very, very good. Uh, once again, we're all in different parts of our Kubernetes journey. And the other thing as well, too, is that despite the obvious technical challenges that come along with it, what we often talk about is the human challenge of surrounding yourself, interacting with other folks who've been doing, you know, who've been, you know, getting into this, the, the, the transitions, the migrations of moving into, into Kubernetes and, and, and trying, to make, trying to make sense out of all of it. Speaking of that, I want to turn it over now to Mark. In your role as, as CTO, and I know you're going to mention this a little bit in your, in your presentation, so if you want, you can start sharing your screen. This is a question that we often look at towards you know, the end of the live stream where we talk about you know, what, are the, what is data on Kubernetes promise on a technical level, but then also on a business level. In Yellowbrick's case, what has been the process and you know, sort of the internal conversations of, hey, we really see some value here that we think we can give um, to our customers that perhaps they're not getting with uh, current conditions, what is it that Kubernetes brings to the table, despite the technical challenge challenges that, that it may have? We've talked about things in terms of performance. We've talked about things in terms of productivity. Where, where's been sort of the, what's been the, the situation like for Yellowbrick, and and what brings us you know to the situation we have today? That's a great question, Bart. And you know what Kubernetes really brings to us as a business and the business value it delivers is ultimately the ability to deploy our data warehousing product anywhere. It's that platform agnostic nature for me that is really important. And when you look at the way that data warehousing is consumed from the past to how it is today and where it's going, increasingly customers want that optionality. They want to be able to run analytics both in an on-premises environment in the public clouds and even in the future at the network edge where most of the data in future is going to actually be generated. And so what Kubernetes buys us is not only the the resilience, the elasticity, the observability, and all of those kind of key features, but just this ability to run on a uniform basis anywhere. Love that. Uh, of a word that, you know, if we're going to play, you know, data on Kubernetes bingo, one of the words, uh, interoperability, seems to come up a fair amount. And perhaps we're going to see that a little bit more in your presentation, but no spoilers. Jump right in. Folks, as always, you can ask your questions in YouTube if for whatever reason in the YouTube chat. If for whatever reason we don't have enough time to get to them in the live stream, we'll definitely address them later on in Slack. Mark, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I want to talk a little bit up front before we get into a demonstration of, of the Yellow Brick Cloud Native Data Warehouse about some of the business challenges that we're facing, what our customers are going through, and what benefits we believe that platforming yellow brick on Kubernetes is going to bring to our customers. But before I get into that, I want to kind of take a step back and describe to you and introduce to you what the yellow brick data warehouse is all about. And of course, when you look at data warehousing, fundamentally, most data warehouses are based on a SQL relational database at its heart. And that's what yellow brick is based on. <clears throat> so we're a massively parallel processing and MPP scale out data warehouse. Um, we're really designed for the most challenging business critical workloads out there. So our customers are customers that want to 
um, run analytics at a high level of concurrency. They've got near real-time analytics problems that they want to solve. It's a mixed, complex workload environment, lots of different types of reporting going on at the same time. They want to deal with streaming feeds. They want to deal with uh, large batch processing going on as well. And as you can imagine, the purpose of a data warehouse, it typically stores the crown jewels in terms of data in most enterprises. It's there to help demand forecasting, you know, um, supply chain management. It's, it's there to help describe the customer journey in order to make predictive um, outcomes and, and deliver kind of value in, out of analytics at scale, looking at the deep history of transactions that are going on within a business. Now, where we differ in terms of speeds and feeds from a lot of our competitors is it's not unusual for us to go into a proof of concept situation um, with, a, with a prospect and find ourselves running at a 10 to 100 times speed up compared to the competition. And typically we operate at a fifth of the cost as well. And so the price performance characteristics are really important for us here. And from our underlying IP, we drive an enormous amount of efficiency out of the underlying hardware um, that, that, that we've that we run on. And as you mentioned, Bart, early on in the stage and development of Yellowbrick, we really focused on delivering our software, our database software on our own hardware instances. But what's really interesting is that the public cloud instances and the arrival of Kubernetes on these public cloud um, instance types as well, enables us to really embrace Kubernetes and use it as a platform to, to deliver our data warehousing capability anywhere. Now, you might think of what's the kind of nature and the evolution of data warehousing. And over the last 10 years, there's been quite a, a major paradigm shift in data warehousing. We've seen the arrival of a lot of cloud native data warehouses or so-called cloud native data warehouses arriving like Snowflake and BigQuery and Amazon's Redshift. And they're characterized in many senses by some key changes in the way data warehouses work. They're characterized by things like a separated compute and storage, instant elasticity, on-demand consumption-based pricing, data sharing, and things like a much more easy to use self-service user experience, something that has never been traditionally associated with data warehouses over the last 40 years. Now, what a lot of these cloud data warehouses today have really forgotten is all of the efficiencies that you had to put in place when you were operating a data warehouse within a fixed compute footprint in a data center on-premises. And so the answer for a lot of cloud data warehouses today is to take advantage of elasticity to scale by simply throwing more boxes at the problem, more EC2 instances, more Azure instances at the problem, rather than thinking how they can squeeze more efficiency out of the underlying hardware, even in the cloud. And so a lot of them are forgetting about how you mix workloads, how you manage workloads more efficiently, more efficiently. They're, they're forgetting about how predictable costs and spend are so important to a business when it comes to large scale data warehousing. That's always been an issue in an on-prem environment. And so what we're doing at Yellowbrick is combining the best of both worlds. We wanna take all of the table stakes capabilities that cloud data warehouses are enabling today, but not forgetting all of the efficiencies that needed to be put in place when you're operating within a fixed narrow footprint as well. Now, what's really interesting is you might not have heard of Yellowbrick, but you know what, you're probably using Yellowbrick today already. And I just wanted to go through a few examples of how our customers today are using Yellowbrick to deliver value to their business. So one of our customers is LexisNexis, and they have a product line called Threat Metrics, which is used for real-time fraud detection. So to put it in a context that, that everyone will really understand is if you make any online purchase that isn't through Amazon, if it's through Best Buy or through airlines or through uh, your, your bank, the chances are that those, um, those transactions will, will go through LexisNexis portal for near real time online fraud detection purposes. And backing that portal is Yellowbrick. So we're in back behind the scenes, helping LexisNexis and you guys, making sure that your credit card payments are sound and the person that's making that purchase is, is you. We work with a lot of telcos as well. And if you're an AT&T customer or a Sprint customer, we're actually behind the scenes making sure that your bill is correct at the end of the month. And we're processing something like 40 billion uh, call detail records a day in order to do revenue assurance. And when you're doing inter-carrier roaming, we're in the back end making sure that your bill is, is correct. 
we work with a lot of insurance companies as well, some of the largest in the world that need to run what are called claims ratio processing uh, uh, applications on a regular basis. They need to make sure that the payouts they're making, uh, you know, balances against the kind of premiums they're coming in. And so Yellowbrick is again behind the scenes powering a lot of this very, very important business critical processing at huge scales. And last but not least, uh, we work with one of the largest credit card companies in the world to support not only their loyalty programs, but also ad hoc analytics over petabytes of data with 4,000 of their business analysts running against Yellowbrick systems. We also do their compliance reporting as well. Again, really mission critical stuff for, for those folks. Now, let's get straight into what we really mean about Yellowbrick on Kubernetes. Um, we wanted to, when we were looking at how we evolve the product from where we were in, a, in an on-prem kind of environment into the public cloud, we wanted to answer some fundamental business questions here. We wanted to answer the questions about how we could run a cloud data warehouse, not only in your own data center, not only as a service in the public cloud, but also in a customer's own virtual private cloud in their own account. And that's something that very few data warehouses in the cloud do today. And it's something that's an immense amount of demand, particularly at the largest enterprises. We also wanted to make the spend about around cloud data warehousing much, much more predictable. We also wanted to figure out a whole new category potentially of opportunity here, which is how could we enable our customers to provide their own data warehouse as a service to their customers as well. So this is a completely kind of unique new area that we are enabling with our Kubernetes version of Yellowbrick. So the very highest level then, I'll talk about Yellowbrick as a data warehouse very quickly. From the outside in, we look like Postgres. So if you're familiar with the Postgres SQL dialects, you're familiar with the ODBC and JDBC drivers, we just work out of the box for all of that. But behind the scenes, we are a very, very different beast. We're an MPP scale out data warehouse um, that's extremely efficient, very easy to manage, highly available, deals with very, very high concurrency in terms of uh, concurrent users and queries, and does that very, very effectively. That Postgres compatibility means we can fit in with a very, very broad ecosystem of tooling around any business, because of course the data warehouse is not the only thing in any enterprise ecosystem. You've got business intelligence tools like Tableau and Power BI. You've got data integration tools like Informatica and, and, and Talend and so on and so forth. You've got Kafka in the mix as inputs as well. And we're there in the middle, storing that data, making it available instantly for query and doing that at sub-second query response times. As we drill down in, from that high-level architecture into the, the microservices side of the world, when you look at many of the kind of legacy data warehouses out there, they've been typically monolithic in nature, of course. You know, you, they, they, um, what that means is you get a great deal of technical debt building up, changing one part of a, a complex data warehouse that might have 20 million lines of source code in it becomes a, an open heart surgery problem, right? And so it's, it's critical as we go forward, as we want to take all of the advantage of Kubernetes and microservices oriented architectures, is that we split out and componentize the different services that we offer within our database software. And so you can see that within our data warehouse, we split out elements that are critical, like the SQL planning capability and optimization. The pieces that compile SQL query plans down into executable code, the pieces that execute those, those pieces of, of code as well, and the user interface as well. And so what this allows us is to put in place a system that is easily updatable and upgradable. It's elastic, it's resilient, it's observable, all of those key features that we associate with Kubernetes. When you look at the highest level view of, of Yellowbrick, and, and I'm going to and Matt's going to kind of demonstrate this working in real life. I wanted to kind of explain what yellow brick would be used for in a business context. So you can imagine at the bottom, you've got a whole bunch of cloud resources at your disposal. It's you've got S3 buckets, you've got EC2 instances, et cetera, et cetera. And it's of no surprise that Yellowbrick's database persists all its data in cheap and deep object storage like S3. Um, what's unique about Yellowbrick, though, is we have something called the Cloud Data Warehouse Manager, which is a single control plane and a single pane of glass from which you can provision instances of the Yellowbrick database in different clouds, even on premises in private clouds as well. As we move up the stack, 
um, we'll, we'll introduce the notions of da data warehouse instances. And these data warehouse instances might be associated with a particular use case, production data warehouse within a telco billing department, for example, as we've got an example here. And what Matt's, is, Matt's going to show you is what sits above those instances, which do all the metadata management of your databases, your tables, et cetera, et cetera, um, to introduce and overlay virtual compute clusters, which are the, the, the engines that actually run SQL queries in parallel. They're multi-node structures, that they're very elastic, they can expand and contract, they can resume, suspend, disappear, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the power courses of, 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 the, of the architecture. So if we go and take a look at those individual components a little bit more, we've got a range of virtual compute clusters that can scale in and out from one node to 128 nodes and back down. You can have 3,000 of these compute clusters tied to a single instance, so they will share data within the instance. Um, we have instances, which I mentioned, managed databases. They're responsible for a set of common shared services that support those virtual compute clusters. And then underpinning and, and orchestrating a lot of this in terms of provisioning is that cloud data warehouse manager control plane. So the Kubernetes orchestration, um, what we've managed to do is throw away a whole ton of code associated with managing the lifecycle of our database. And we've offloaded that responsibility onto Kubernetes itself. So this is how we're getting really, really tight integration with Kubernetes here. We're letting the declarative nature of Kubernetes establish instances, making sure instance services stay up, making sure that the various pieces of the virtual compute clusters are available and, and come back up in the event of, of, of some service failure. But what's actually, again, unique about what we've done is we want to hide a lot of the complexity and the command line feel of managing Helm charts and Kubernetes at that level. And what we've done is put an SQL interface onto Kubernetes. Now, this is really critical because if you think of a, a user persona like, um, like a DBA, a database administrator, or, or a, a data engineer who wants to do some analytics with Yellowbrick and wants to spin up virtual data warehouses and then throw them away to, to cut costs. Um, they can now work within their favorite SQL cl client tool, and they can easily through SQL create virtual compute clusters, resize them, suspend them, resume them, and interleave that with SQL to actually run reports. That's, that's critically important. So, you know, the, the underpinning part of this is Kubernetes is a single truth source of truth for the, for the cluster state ultimately. Um, and what we've split from a microservices architecture perspective, all of our individual components of our data warehouse into these different um, pod uh, definitions. And so we've got replica sets for the bulk load services that can easily scale out depending on the workload on ingest coming in. We have stateful sets up in our, our worker instances and worker nodes, which are actually responsible for crunching numbers and doing the analytics. And so we're fully invested in, in, the, in Kubernetes at, at every level. So again, to drill down in finally into kind of the workers themselves, what we've done is uh, have a situation of there's one worker per pod per node. So in a virtual compute cluster, you have multiple nodes in this massively parallel scale out of a compute cluster. Each node has one worker pod running on it. And there's a very good reason why we have one worker pod because we actually control all of the underlying hardware resources on that node. Um, one of the drawbacks of many data warehouses and databases today is that they are not in tune and very, very, very closely tied to the underlying hardware that they're running on. And in order to get the most efficient performance out of the underlying hardware, even EC2 instances in the cloud, we want to control the memory management, the threading, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we want to take advantage of the ability to stream data directly off ephemeral NVMe SSD drives on these EC2 instances, pipe it straight through the PCIe buses, straight into the root nodes on the CPUs themselves. So we do all of these kinds of tricks to do that. So in the architecture then, all of the yellow brick table data is stored in object store. As we ingest data, it goes through each worker in parallel and gets pushed and persisted straight to S3. Those are those kind of down arrows coming from the, the worker um, pods. And when we read data, 
when a query comes in, we want to query some data in tables or do some joins and things like that. What we're doing is pulling data out of S3, hydrating the local NVMe caches on each of those worker nodes. And then subsequently, if other tables, if other queries reference the same data, the same tables, they're going to be pushed out, pulled out of the local NVMe drive for performance reasons. One of the things that we do that is fundamentally different, as I mentioned, is, is have a very tight, tight binding to the underlying hardware, even cloud hardware as well. And cloud instances have come a long way over the last few years. And now we are able with the latest generation of cloud hardware to truly control, even at the bare metal level, what's going on here and taking full advantage for performance and efficiency reasons. So most databases are built on Linux, but Linux is a great general, general purpose operating system, but it's not really tuned for data warehousing analytics operations. And so when we spin up these instances, these nodes, we actually ask Linux to get out of the way. We run in user space bypass mode, um, which means that we run a Linux process to manage memory ourselves, to put in our own optimized threading model, to introduce our own device drivers, um, our own network drivers and so on and so forth. So we really optimize our software stack at every level. So I waffled on a long time there. I hope that made a lot of sense. But what we want to do now is actually show this in reality. So what I'm going to do is ask Matt to kind of walk through a demo of what Yellowbrick looks like running on AWS, running on Kubernetes within the Elastic Kubernetes service there. Well, so, while Matt gets that set up, Mark, I do have a couple of questions is that because you know, we're talking about Matt's experience of getting started with Kubernetes. You mentioned some great examples and I really appreciate that. And this is a message to all of our, our folks in the audience and future speakers. We love hearing about the business cases, about who is actually you know, paying for this, who is, where are they seeing the value? These technologies might have bells and whistles and shine and, and glow in the dark and do things like that. But if they're really not providing value, then it's gonna be tricky for them to be adopted and to get those end user success stories. You're talking about uh, you know, financial institutions, credit card companies, et cetera, et cetera. When you have to break the ice and have that conversation and mention, well, we're, you know, we're moving things into Kubernetes, how do you approach that? How do you make sure that, uh, you know, because there can be security concerns, we're talking about compliance, we're talking about very sensitive data. How do you, how do you approach that in such a way so, so that people don't have to feel too uncomfortable? Um, that because a lot of times the, the assumption is leave the data alone, don't touch it. What's your experience been like and what tips might you have for other folks that could find themselves in a similar situation? Yeah, and it's all, we always start at the top with the business problem and the use case that the customer is trying to solve, right? And, and the worst thing you can ever do is start getting buried in the technical details of how these things are implemented until it's necessary to do that. But I do think actually implementing on Kubernetes and concerning yourselves necessarily with, with security and data governance and privacy, they're somewhat orthogonal problems. What I like to talk about to prospects is, you know, what it, what what this technology can deliver when you're using data warehouse in the data warehouses in the past you're running within a fixed format kind of compute system you know you don't have that elasticity you don't have the ability to kind of shrink down and turn up turn off this capability and not pay for it when you're not using it and so that's the kind of emergent capability that Kubernetes buys businesses. We can say to businesses, you know what? You can spin up a cluster of, of yellow brick, run your analytics for a period of time and then throw it away and stop paying for it. And you know, customers haven't been able to do that in the past. And so suddenly uh, light bulbs go on. They can go, well, we can just do ad hoc analytics. We can do sort of exploratory analytics on data that we wouldn't have thought about doing because we never had capacity to do that before. We've got unlimited untapped capacity in the cloud to kind of answer major business problems. And, and that's, the, that's the real element I, I always like to address. I think the Kubernetes side of things is cool and, and great, but for us, it's just, it's just provides everything that, that the business ultimately wants. Yeah, it happens to be called Kubernetes, but we can kind of leave that aside. And like you said, yeah. don't, don't get them bogged down in the technical details. Keep it high level, focus on, like you said, how they're going to be addressing those, those use cases and, and solving business problems. Perfect. Um, well, yeah, we can turn it over to Matt now if you want to run the demo. Just as uh, for folks that are, that, are, that are in the audience, when he starts switching to code, if for whatever reason you have difficulty seeing, just let us know, and then he can zoom in a little bit more. And I'll, I'll just team that up a little bit more just to give you an overview of what we're going to see here. Um, you know, we have something called the Yellow Brick Manager, which is a UI for managing 
clusters, which actually is under, fundamentally built on top of that SQL interface to Kubernetes. So everything that Matt shows you through the UI, you can actually do from the command line through SQL. He's going to show you both of those things happening. But what we want to kind of show you is, is really the power of Kubernetes under the, under the hood here as well. So we're not only going to show you the yellow brick view of the world, we're going to show you what's happening at pod level as Matt runs some of these SQL commands to, to alter things like the size of virtual compute clusters, um, setting, uh, re restarting, destroying them, suspending them. So without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and stop sharing and hand it over to Matt. Sounds good. Let's do it. Hey, Mark. Um, thank you for such a wonderful setup. Let me uh, share my screen here. Um, just making sure you guys can see my, my, my window here. Yep. Looks okay, good. great. So um, I'll put a little disclaimer over our demo. So this, uh, as Mark said, is running in a EKS cluster in Amazon US West 2. For the demo today, we're going to sort of use two tools, like Mark said. We're going to use our Yellow Brick Manager, which is our single pane of glass control plane, as well as a sort of uh, data exploration tool. And then we're also going to use a tool called Lens to actually look at what's happening on the back end of the Kubernetes cluster as we create um, virtual compute clusters and change them, we'll be able to drill in and actually look at what actually is happening. So um, this is a live demo again, so please bear with me if we have any hiccups, but I think we should be okay. Uh, before we get started also, I wanted to um, sing the praises of Lens, by the way, as someone who is sort of newer to Kubernetes in the last sort of six to eight months, this has been an invaluable tool for me. So if you, uh, if you guys are not using it, I, I highly recommend that you guys do. So with that, we'll get started. So when you provision a Yellowbrick Cloud instance, um, you know, you'll, you'll be given a management console and you can log in. Um, I'm using some local credentials here, but this will actually integrate with your um, OAuth 2 uh, authentication services. So things like Okta and Office 365. When you log in, you're greeted with sort of this high level overview of what, what's available in the product. So um, again, this is a single pane of glass and a one-stop shop for both people who are kind of system administrators, DBAs, and as well as your sort of citizen data scientists. So there's kind of something in here for everyone. So you can view your instances, you can explore what data you have available. And in fact, you can actually run some ad hoc queries on your data to do some exploratory work before maybe you turn it into a real application. So, if, um, oh, and then another important thing here is uh, we make it very easy to load your data as well. So we'll demo that a little bit as well. So if we start looking at one of our instances, you know, you kind of see, hey, I have a, a, a instance here that I was created. It's called Data on Kubernetes Demo. As Mark mentioned, this Yellow Brick Manager is actually capable of managing multiple instances. I only have one here at the moment. And the way to think about an instance here is that it's sort of the transaction domain. So it's a it's an MPP database that's front end. It has many databases inside of it, all sort of sharing the same data, but it might be logically separate from another instance where you you know they're not sharing the same backing store. So to set up the demo, I preloaded uh, TPCDS Scale Factor 1000, which for people who are not familiar, um, is a standard industry benchmark data set for uh, a data warehouse. And one th SF1000 just means that this is the one terabyte size. So uncompressed, it was around 800 gigabytes. Compressed, it's around 300 gigabytes, plus a few other things. So in this pane here, we have a dashboard. We have some nice graphs. But we can also start looking at our databases that are here. And we'll drill into this as we kind of move through the demo. Most importantly, we can actually look at our compute clusters. So I had a, a previously created cluster where I loaded this data, I called it default cluster, has two nodes. So to get into the demo, first thing we'll do is we'll create a new cluster and we'll load some data with it. So as Mark mentioned, SQL is a first class citizen here, but we also provide a nice UI builder. So you know, we'll do a little bit of both and I'll show how we can use SQL and the UI. So I'll create a cluster called load test. Actually, we'll call it load cluster, how about that? I'm going to select my hardware instance type. Um, an interesting Kubernetes integration here is that this isn't um, something that was hard coded to the product. This is actually being sourced from the live Kubernetes cluster through some custom resource definitions that we've created to expand the Kubernetes API. We'll select the large V1 instance type. Uh, that's primarily what's backing this EKS cluster at the moment. We'll create one with two nodes. We'll kind of get an overview of, of how many resources this is going to spawn. So this is roughly 32 vCPUs, 128 gigabytes of RAM per instance. We're going to have roughly 2.4 terabytes of local NVMe cache, not really stored, but cache here between all of them. We have some policy things here that, that we'll drill into a little bit later. This is not the default cluster. 
as Mark mentioned, we have the ability to automatically suspend and resume on idle. We're not really interested in that functionality right now. So I could, I'm going to click create here and we can see the pods come up. But before I do that, as we mentioned, SQL is a first class citizen. You'll see everywhere in our UI, we have a little SQL button here. And this will actually show you what you'd have to type into a SQL prompt and to do the same thing. So we'll do that for some of the other ones. So with that, before I do this, I'm going to hop over to Lens real quick and say, oops, see that I have my Kubernetes cluster running. I have a couple pods that are already running. And so the sort of three of them here, and when I hit create, what's going to happen is you're going to see a bunch more pods spin up on a bunch of our worker nodes. So I'll go ahead and I'll do that now. When I hop over here, you see that the pods are coming up on the nodes. Um, as Mark mentioned, what's actually happening here behind the scenes is pulling our worker runtime image from an image repository that we can specify onto the nodes. So I'm packing the image, it's starting up. And then as Mark mentioned, we kind of asked Linux to get out of the way. And this cut through um, hardware capability is only possible with sort of the later Kubernetes clusters, the later container technologies. So it's unpacking our worker image. We're acquiring most of the memory out of the Linux like host operating system, we're detaching the NVMe PCIe devices, where we are attaching our own NVMe drivers. And then the cluster will sort of form its own little compute cluster. It'll synchronize our metadata. And then we should come back and we should see that the cluster was created successfully. And you'll notice here that I have another cluster called load cluster that's now running. Um, so then moving on to loading data, which is kind of one of the biggest things that our customers do before they can really query it. Um, we're going to use a, a nice feature that we have here to set something up. So we have our a little like kind of data exploration tool here and also allows us to run queries and load data here. You can see I created a bunch of, of, of databases and tables. We're going to load uh, one of the TPCDS tables into this load test database. To do this, um, so instead of seeing me type stuff, I'll actually make use of our Yellowbird sample catalog. So when you know when you get a cloud instance and you want to explore the capabilities here, it's advantageous to have the ability to sort of one-click load things in. So um, I'm going to just set up the schema first. Here we're not going to load the whole uh, one terabyte, and that would take a little bit too long. And what happens when I hit setup is it puts all of the SQL in here that you might want to see. Again, um, we have wizards to help you build this, and I'll show that in a second. I'm going to make sure that we're pointing at our load test database. I'll put it over here so we can see it run in action. As an extension to this, I'm going to say um, which cluster to use. And then I'm going to run it. This is going to go off and it's, it executed seven statements. And you can see that we have a new schema that got created over here with a bunch of tables. Next, I'll actually set up our bulk load facility. And we're not going to load all of these things. Um, again, I need to set this to the right database. I'm just going to load, uh, for example, here, uh, let's load catalog returns, which is, uh, I think it's something like 11 gigabytes or something like that. So again, we'll use cluster here. And then I can ask it to run. What you'll notice is the task is shown up here and we can see that this is actually running. So this is actually a SQL query. And what's actually happening here is that we've planned it as a SQL query. It started running on our worker nodes. It's then made a call out to our bulk loading microservice that Mark previously mentioned. And then it's going to go out and connect to S3 and start pulling some data in. And you can see here, we're loading data at around 600 megabytes a second. Um, and this is sort of with a, a nominal bulk load service. In future and in larger instances, this will actually scale out. So we loaded uh, around 25 gig, I think, total in here. And so that was pretty quick, actually. So this kind of shows the power of these EC2 instances and the power of their cut through networking. So to kind of drill down a little bit further to our data exploration tool, you can see that in here, created all these schemas, we loaded catalog returns. And we can see. I loaded 144 million rows. It was around 8.3 gigabytes after we were done compressing it. And it was around 21.5 gigabytes when we actually, in, in its uncompressed form. So uh, just as a, you know, a further example, we can just count specifically how many rows are in here. We can run this. Oh. I might have had a typo there. Let's 
There we go. We have an interactive SQL UI builder that helps you eliminate these typos. So yes, as you can see down here, we loaded around 14 million rows. On top of this, um, you know, this sort of way to query things via SQL, we also have um, GUI actions here. So we can go in and we can actually look at like the first hundred rows of our data to make sure it looked right. Again, this is demo data. So we, these are all sort of random numbers, um, but it also provides some data visualization capabilities, which are interesting. I think it's key to point out that we're not trying to replace something like Tableau or Looker, but this is really for your you know, data scientist use cases who are loading in fresh data and they're wanting to come up with new you know, analysis to run or reports to create. This kind of provides them a quick and easy way to just drill in in a single place into their data and look to make sure what's in there makes sense. So um, a common use case that we see at a lot of our customers here is that they leave a cluster up and running and it's, you know, continues to load data 24 hours a day. And we're not talking about trickle insert data. We're talking about customers that are loading terabytes an hour into our system. So to kind of emulate that, I'll leave this um, cluster alone, and I'll create another close cluster for actually doing some querying of our data. So I'll actually use SQL this time, and I'll call this test cluster. And again, I'll, I'll get two nodes here. And again, we don't want to auto suspend and we don't want to auto resume. But again, just to demonstrate that we have a SQL interface here, I'll actually copy this over to the clipboard and I'll move over to an actual ODBC connection, which is here. We can actually run this live. So if I hit enter, with a semicolon, hold on. Again, some more pods have spun up. So you know we saw the UI way to do things. We can also see it being done through the SQL command line. What's nice about this is it allows uh, our customers to script things easily. So you could, for example, have a bunch of your queries and you could wrap them in a create and uh, drop cluster statement. And you could just point it at the SQL data warehouse. It would spin up the clusters as needed, run your analysis, and then shut everything down. This pod has taken a little while to start, I suspect, because it hasn't had the image on it before. So we're going to just sort of let it run for a second while it pulls the image. While that's running, I also wanted to highlight a few other uh, cool features that we have here. So um, Yellowbrick has one of the world's best uh, workload management systems. So while this is running, you saw in the query over here, we have a default WLM profile set up. You can actually create your own custom WLM profiles over here through a guided wizard and again through SQL. So um, this is actually quite a complex thing where what we do is we take all of the compute resources, your memory, your CPUs and your storage and it allows you to slice and dice them and carve them up within a given cluster and then also across clusters. So we can look at what might be in a uh, like a flex pool here where we have a couple resource pools where it says, hey, uh, most everything runs in a mixed pool, but if I have long running queries, they get moved to like a long running query pool. One of the things that's quite advanced about our engine here is actually we have a rule builder here and you can actually write workload shaping rules in SQL, but also in JavaScript. So an example of this is looking over here, let me move forward. You can see down here, I can create rules through our UI builder, but I can also create um, them through JavaScript. And as I add conditions here, it'll actually create the JavaScript here and I can copy and paste it if I wanted to. All right, let's see if that pod came up. That pod came up and we can see our, our cluster is now up. So um, I'll pause our workload management here and actually do some querying against a larger data set. So let's go back over here. I just add a little bit of color around the workload management thing, if I could, from a business perspective, yes. why, why it's really critical. Because you can imagine you've got different users within a line of business or line of businesses that all have got different types of workloads, different type of, types of queries they want to run. And some are more important than others. You know, your CEO's uh, daily dashboard of the business uh, status is probably really critically important. And so you want to make sure his queries run in very, very short order, whereas other maybe large, long running ad hoc queries for exploratory purposes are lower priority. And so the workload management capability and these rules that Matt talks about allows us to automatically tag and direct queries to the right resource pools at the right priority so that we can kind of manage resources very effectively. So. Yep. Very good. Um, you, one, of the, one other question, Matt, um, since you mentioned Lens earlier, someone in the audience huh? asked if you could explain a little bit more about what your learning process was like uh, getting used to using that. And if there are any tips or resources that you might recommend. 
Uh, sure. Uh, I have Lens up here. So Lens has been a real eye-opener for me. Uh, when I started learning Kubernetes, I didn't actually know that it existed. So, you know, kubectl command line was basically the one and only way in which I was doing things. I was hand editing YAML files. I was trying to read the Kubernetes documentation. Um, and it was interesting and the documentation is great, but it's also a really slow way to develop things, right? So, you know, you're always hand editing stuff and running kubectl apply and pushing things into the cluster and trying to decode what happens in the API responses. And then also trying to figure out what you can and can't do. Lens accelerated that. I mean, Lens builds itself as an IDE for Kubernetes and it's actually 100% true. So instead of all of that kubectl hand editing stuff, Lens is incredibly powerful. For example, I can come over here and I can, for example, edit actual Kubernetes resources on the fly, save them and see them get automatically applied to my Kubernetes cluster. This 10x my productivity um, when, when actually running and developing stuff because I was no longer having to go through kubectl and manage config files and, and push stuff and read responses. I could edit stuff live, click apply, see what happened, make other changes, click apply very quickly. So, um, you know, Lens is an incredibly powerful tool. It's free. Uh, and it integrates pretty much with all the major um, Kubernetes things, EKS and all that kind of stuff. And you can actually have them stacked over here on the side and you can switch between your Kubernetes instance or Kubernetes clusters very quickly. So uh, did that answer the question? I, I hope, it, hope it did. Definitely, definitely. We're good, right. thank you. Yeah. All right, so um, I'll continue with our demo here a little bit. So. I wouldn't assume the people on the call are SQL experts. So I'm, I'm not going to ask people to, to sort of introspect what this query does. This is one of the standard benchmark queries. Um, if I'm looking at the, the thing from them, it says it computes revenue ratios across item classes, but it's kind of unimportant for our demo. But this is more of an example of a real big data warehousing query. And just for reference, it's referencing tables like web sales and item. You know, web sales has, I think, 2.3 billion rows in web sales, something on that order. Uh, it's a little smaller, it's 700, 700 million, um, but just kind of give you a, a feeling for the scale. So uh, I'll hit run on this guy and you can see it's been running for a while. And like Mark mentioned, I just created a fresh cluster. Uh, the caches will be cold. All of this data is actually gonna be sourced from S3 on the first time. So ran about nine seconds. Uh, again, performance is, is variable depending upon your instance types, but again, you can look at it here. Um, I talked about how this is a single pane of glass for people who might be DBAs. There's other stuff here that's kind of interesting. We can look at statistics for the plan, uh, see how long it ran, how much data it used. And we can also visualize our actual result set. So for example, this, this is a visualization of the result set that came back here. And it actually allows you to slice and dice it by various um, columns here. I think, uh, I think it's, maybe it's item ID. Oh, um, Item revenue, there you go. So th this is really a visualization of what that query is telling us there. So that ran at about nine seconds. Now that the caches are a little bit warmer, I would assume that it's gonna run a little faster. So I clicked the run button again. I think it'll probably be five, five six seconds. Yep, yeah, so it was around four and a half seconds, right? So this might be fast enough and, and maybe I've tuned my workload manager rules, but it's still maybe I need more performance. So we can go over and we can transparently expand one of our clusters. So um, I'll do that over here by going back to our instance dashboard, I'll go to my test cluster and I'll say change. And I will add just one compute node as Amazon's being a little stingy with them at the moment. I won't make any other changes. And I'll hit change. And again, see the SQL button is present. You can see what that would actually look like here. And I can hit change. It'll say, hey, you know, this might cancel running queries. What policy would you like to have here? And we'll say activate now. Um, you know, we have different policies here. You can wait, wait a couple of minutes if there are running queries to not disrupt existing workloads, um, all that kind of stuff. So we should go over here and we should see yet another pod come up. This guy might. Hopefully he's quick and has had the image cached. If not, he'll be pulling the image here. Ah, yeah, so he's, he's having to pull the image fresh again as well. So we don't actually have to sit here and wait for this to spin. What I'll do, I'll just say close. And I'll go back for our query tab. And we'll wait for this guy to come up. 
It's an interesting thing that I've learned while, while on Amazon is that the, the nodes should keep all of the images cached locally, but I found that they actually expire after a while. And Amazon will actually evict the node images from the Kubernetes nodes after a time, which is why, why it's taking a little while to come up. And Matt, that image is getting pulled from the Elastic uh, Container Registry, right? Correct. It's getting pulled from the Elastic Container Registry uh, and it's getting pulled down and then it has to spin up on the node. It has to allocate all of its memory. Um, and then it's going to join the cluster and then it's going to provision itself. And we can kind of see what's happening using lens here. Instead of using, again, this is another, another example of using the power of lens. Instead of having to use, for example, kubectl, uh, get logs, I can actually sit here and say, hey, what is it doing? So, you know, it's pulling the image, it successfully pulled the image. And now I just saw the little thing turn green and it's transitioned into the running state. We'll just make sure that he's online when I look at the test cluster. Yep, cluster was configured successfully. All right, let's go back to our query. Let's run him again. Again, this one work is gonna have cold, a cold cache compared to the other guys. Uh, but it should, on the second run, be a little bit faster. So off the bat, it was about five seconds. Now that the caches are a little bit warmer, it probably will be somewhere around neighborhood of, of three, three seconds or so. Yeah, 3.7 seconds. Um, so you know, there are times when it's advantageous to scale vertically for certain workloads by using bigger and bigger instances, but then there are times when you need to scale horizontally just to get enough horsepower to run stuff. So, you know, like, like they say in uh, car culture, there's no replacement for displacement. So by adding some more CPUs to the problem, you know, we can get a better, better performance. So yeah, it's about 2.9 seconds. So again, this is now using compute resources and I might, for example, say, hey, I'm done running my workload for the day. Um, I'd like to, to, to release those resources. And what I'll do is I'll bring back my, my shell over here. And instead of actually using even the, the builder, I'll just do it by hand from SQL. So I'll say alter cluster, test cluster with no count to, and this will automatically do it uh, via SQL. And what we'll see over here is we'll see this pod now has gone away. He's come off the node. This is gonna run for a little while because we're gonna have to, to acquire all the clusters, acquire this cluster, make sure there are no queries running. The existing clusters will note that, that their partner is gone. They'll reform a cluster and they'll sync their metadata. And here we go. So one of the last features I wanted to show is sort of uh, suspending and resuming and what that might look like. So again, what I'll do is I'll come over here to the clusters. I'll create another cluster. Let's call it suspend me. Um, we'll give them only a single node. Uh, he do not need to automatically suspend and resume as I don't want to wait the five minutes. I'll just, just force him to kind of come and go. So again, we should see a pod come up. And again, the image is now cached and it comes up much, much faster when they're cached on the nodes. We'll give it a second to join the data warehouse. Over here. We'll just close this. It'll become available in a second. There it is. I'll refresh him so we see all of our clusters. I see suspend me. And this is something that a DBA might do or a system administrator. We can, we can click into the cluster and we can say, hey, I, I'd like to just suspend him. And it will say, hey, uh, this is a, it might be a destructive operation for things that are running. Again, we get the same policy hints here. What do I wanna do? Do I wanna wait one minute for queries to complete? No, we'll just activate now. And again, we say that the pod immediately comes off of the node and the resources for this node are now available for other clusters to expand into if they need it. So one of the things that's actually nice about this, as Mark mentioned, is we used to have to write a bunch of custom clustering code to do all of this. With Kubernetes, it's now API calls to scale up and down our replica sets and our stateful sets. So that's pretty much what I wanted to get through with the demo. Uh, before I shut down any clusters, was there anything else, Mark, that I might have forgotten? That covers oh, it. Mark, I think you're muted. Oh no, no, you're not. Sorry. I think that I think that I think that covers it nicely. Yeah. And so right. you know, Kubernetes has really brought a huge amount of value to us in terms of the the time to market. You know, there's a lot of the heavy lifting that might be traditionally associated with all of this elastic cluster management. That's that's not our core business problem anymore. It's Kubernetes problem. We can focus on getting the most optimal analytics and giving the, that kind of benefit to our customers. And so, you know, we're, we're all in on Kubernetes, uh, big supporters of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And, uh, and we're, you know, 
delighted that you, you could invite us on Bart today to, uh, to of course. Chat yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's like I said, we, this is kind of what we started out with is everyone's at a different point in this journey. And, and obviously as well too, people are, are facing different challenges. Based on your experience, do you feel that what we ask a lot of folks is, you know, getting data on Kubernetes, and it's interesting to see this too, you know, traditionally speaking, when we talk about data on Kubernetes is if it's something, you know, that's, you know, 50 years old. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, database and storage, but seeing it branch out to other areas such as machine learning, analytics, et cetera, is very exciting to see a widening landscape and ecosystem. But go ahead, what, I wanna, what I wanted to ask both of you is that for other organizations that are thinking about making the jump, because, you know, up until now, there's been a lot of, ah, just keep the data out and do everything statelessly, et cetera. Is running data on Kubernetes a technical challenge? Is it a knowledge challenge? Is it a money challenge? Is it a personnel challenge? It could be a, a mixture of those factors. Matt, could you start out? What do you think about that? And then I want to get your opinion too, Mark. Sure. Um, so you have to be judicious about, about how you um, manage your state on Kubernetes as Kubernetes has traditionally been kind of a stateless thing. Um, I will say, you know, Kubernetes is a bit of a moving target. It's evolving quickly. And the newer versions have provided the, um, the primitives needed to kind of make this a bit safer. So things like stateful sets, for example, where um, you know inside of your EKS cluster, there's a you know a persistent key value store called etcd that's always there. So you know storing data now isn't as much of a concern as it might have been say um, a while ago. So uh, it's a technical problem number one, um, and you just have to be judicious about it, and you have to leverage the APIs in, in the ways that they're meant to be leveraged, and it kind of it kind of falls out actually pretty naturally once you're done. So. On top of that, though, there's other things like persistent volume claims and other resources like that that are actually um, incredibly powerful tools. And what we've seen is that they've actually um, been very reliable, very easy to manage, and very configurable for both you know on-prem stuff and stuff in the cloud. And it kind of again, it, it's um, infrastructure agnostic, as, as kind of Mark said. It kind of we, we write this once, it runs everywhere. It has the right abstraction, so I think it's good. Um, culturally speaking, for like with our customers, it's been a bit of an interesting journey. I'll speak to only my experiences as engaging customers from a support standpoint and seeing. So a lot of our customers um, have actually been the ones saying they want to kind of move to the cloud because the volumes of data now are getting so large that a lot of our customers are actually already coming to us and saying, you know, we don't have the capacity in our data center to hold you know, five or six petabytes, or we or not even capacity, we, have a, we don't have a desire to hold five or six petabytes in infrastructure that we manage. So actually a lot of our customers have actually already made that leap. And they're actually already saying, our data is in S3, our data is in Azure Blob Store. And what they care about and what they clamor for is an easy way to get it into the warehouse. Uh, and that's why we kind of showed this quick data load form. So, um, you know, I think sentiments are already changing and people are getting sort of more and more comfortable with the cloud. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a good time to be on Kubernetes. Very, very good point. Uh, we got a question from the audience. Uh, thank you, Jose, for asking the question. Either one of you can answer this. Um, uh, so how does the database decide whether it needs to check the data in S3 again, instead of using the cached results? That's a good question. So um, I want to talk about when we say caching at Yellowbrick, we never cache results. We only cache the raw data. Um, and how, how does it know it needs to update it? It's all running inside of Postgres. So everything is transactional, transactionally aware. So if one cluster wrote data and another cluster might query the data, how, how will it know that it needs to pull in the new data from S3? We have a metadata synchronization system. So what happens is when that query is run against, let's say the query is run against the cluster that loaded the data, he knows that, the, that there's data in S3 that he now needs to fetch. So kind of no, a, a no op problem. But let's say you go to the other cluster who didn't know. What's gonna happen is as part of the query startup time, when it runs the compilation phases and when it selects the metadata, it will go, ah, I see some transactions have been committed since I last looked at this. I will consult my in-memory metadata that's shared amongst all the clusters. And it will go, ah, there's some data in S3. So, and then it will pull stuff down. But from a technical level, it's actually all hidden from us. So um, we've actually layered this very nicely where, you know, we have our storage targets like S3 or local storage. There's a metadata layer that's shared. And then, you know, we, if a request comes in from data, it goes into the metadata layer and it's sort of transparent, basically. It's all transactional inside of Postgres. It's all, and it says, oh, there's more data. Some of it might be sourced from S3. Some of it might be sourced from my local cache. And it's completely transparent to the upper levels of the technical stack. Very, very good. Perfect. Mark, is there anything you'd like to add regarding, you know, the benefits that Kubernetes is providing or what you think 
um, that folks need to see more of. Once again, I think this is such a great case uh, looking at what Yellow Brick's been doing because a lot of this comes down to trust, confidence, et cetera. Um, but in your opinion, what needs to happen in order for more organizations to make the jump to getting their data on Kubernetes? Well, one of the things we recognize, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, is that what elements of building this software stack are really core business to us and which aren't. And for, for us, Kubernetes takes a lot of the heavy lifting around the infrastructure management off our, off our backs and allows us to focus on being the best data warehouse uh, on the planet effectively, which is what we want to be, um, and you know, satisfy our customers there. It also you know, opens up opportunities and new use cases in business that um, weren't addressable before. And I mentioned some of those before around the kind of ad hoc nature of of, of queries and analytics and being able to, um, from a cost perspective, really decide when you wanna spend money on analytics and when you don't. And so it supports a whole new kind of consumption-based uh, spend model for us in the cloud. So that's really important and going beyond the kind of fixed capacity subscription side of things that we've had before. So I, I think that, 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 that's really in my mind what, um, what, what really sets it apart for us. Very, very good. Great points there. And like you said, once again, trust and confidence and comfort for, for customers of not thinking that costs are going to get completely out of control um, and that things are going to be adjusted. Once again, as we talked earlier about the interoperability, you know, giving that flexibility and, um, and once again, relief to customers of not feeling that they're going to be trapped. We do have one more question here um, from Alistair. He says, I'm a bit off target, uh, a bit off tangent uh, here. I guess, but how do you deal uh, with personally identifiable info in your data workflows, say in the context of, you know, the European Union uh, GDPR, or is that done outside of this data on Kubernetes workflow? Well, we, we have um, two solutions for that. We, we have something that we call um, CARE, column at rest encryption. And so technically within the product built in, you can encrypt particular columns of data within the tables that we've just seen, for example, such that only certain users get to see the, the columns and in, values in clear text and others, depending on their role and permissions, will, will not get access to those columns. And so if you combine that with classic SQL views and column encryption, you can very easily set up very, very limited, restrictive um, uh, uh, views of, of data, depending on who you are and whether you're permission to access it. Now, we actually got partners as well, like Protegrity, that we deeply integrate with that go far beyond that and will do things like data masking of PII data um, and allow you to do um, masking and security control, not only within a yellow brick context, but across different applications in your own, own business. And so for us, it's a, a combination of some inbuilt technology plus partner plays. Really, really like that. And also, once again, you know, we're tackling, tackling global problems, thinking about global organizations, because even just inside the European Union, how the legislation might change regarding compliance from one, from one country to another can get confusing. So it's really good that you, you're one step ahead um, and got that integrated. Thank you for the question, Alistair. Yes. Um, we are pretty much at time. So like I said, if you want to continue the conversation, both these gentlemen will be available, um, both on our Slack as well, as well in other places, easy to find on Twitter, on LinkedIn, et cetera. Love the presentation. And, you know, we've done 106 live streams, so we've seen a little bit of everything. I can't say that I've ever seen such a great balance really between the tech and business side, which is so helpful. Um, and I think it's a recommendation to future speakers that we really want to double down on this. And as much as, like I said, the technology is very exciting, it's, there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm going into it, really integrating and, and doubling down on those business concepts, I think is, is, is crucial. And I, I appreciate both of you doing that. Just getting some feedback in, um, in the in YouTube channel, uh, the YouTube chat. Thanks to both of you for the great demo and additional info. Um, before we go though, we do have a tradition in our community. So while you were, while you were uh, both giving your presentations, we have our graphic recorder, Angel, who's in the background. You should be able to see my screen. Um, so he did a visual, he created this drawing while you were talking, a visual representation of, of the different things that were being mentioned. I did not want to go the cliche route where we started and say, is there any kind of Wizard of Oz connection with, uh, with Yellow Brick? Perhaps there is, perhaps there isn't. That's for another live stream for another day. Um, but anyway, thank you very much, um, both of you, for your time today. Really, really enjoyed it. Great interaction with the audience, too. Um, for those of you who arrived late, don't worry. The live stream will be up on YouTube. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We can always continue the conversation in Slack. Matt and Mark, thank you both very much.